And greetings, friends. Picture our big city hospitals. What will happen when the next pandemic strikes? They will be overwhelmed. The doctors will probably run out of flu shots or other shots. There will be absolute panic. Do you think this can happen here? Most of you know better. What is the only real solution for the disease epidemics predicted to strike our peoples? Stay tuned. Most of you know that scientists and medical authorities are genuinely fearful of a pandemic of avian flu, bird flu, which could strike our nations within the next very few months. Estimates of the deaths which may be caused by this bird flu range all the way from 15 to 150 million people. In any case, my friends, that is scary. Obviously, those in the medical community will do their best to contain this disease. But nearly all the scientific experts agree that multiple thousands, if not millions, would die in any full-scale pandemic. These little chickens that we're picturing here and birds look so harmless. However, my friends, by transmitting avian flu to each other and eventually to humans, the pandemic could strike any time. So what should you do? And what should you do if you believe in the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus Christ? Notice what Jesus Christ said in your Bible. Again, I say, don't believe me. You learn to prove these things. Prove what the other guys are saying, but prove what we say on this program. See what the Bible actually says. Turn to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, if you would, chapter 2 and verse 17. Here Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. That's a pretty clear statement. Those who are sick have need of a physician. And he goes on to say, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So certainly Jesus was using the analogy of physical sickness, but the analogy in the Bible is always true. It's a right analogy. Yes, those who are sick need a physician in such a time as a sickness or a terrible pandemic. But these dedicated men and women will try to help you. But what if their hospital facilities and medical facilities are overwhelmed, the drug supplies run out, and there is absolute chaos in the whole community? Then what? <laughs> then you and I need to be genuinely realistic. For we are living, my friends, you know this, many of you, we're living in the prophesied last days when all kinds of things like this are predicted to occur, predicted by Jesus Christ, predicted by the prophets of God from one end of the Bible to the other. Notice what the Jesus Christ of the Bible directly prophesied. Turn with me now in your Bible, turn please to Matthew chapter 24. These things are exciting when you understand them. They're talking about your future, the very real future ahead of us soon. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3. Now, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came and asked him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Not 70 A.D. or some other time, but the end of this 6,000 years of human history under the influence of Satan the devil, when you understand it. We're coming to that time now. And Jesus said, Take heed that no one deceive you. He showed how many would come, not a few, and would deceive the many. And then he said, Nation will rise against nation, different ethnic groups, one against the other, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, yes, lack of food, terrible drought and famine, and pestilence, disease epidemics and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Many other things are predicted, as you know. Disease epidemics. Yes, real disease epidemics are predicted to occur by Jesus Christ and by God's other servants throughout the Bible. Jesus said so. But he also showed us that something else 
needs to occur, which very few Christians seem to understand. Yet it is all through the inspired Bible. It's all through the New Testament, particularly. Jesus showed that the great God of creation, our Father, really does heal the sick if we can learn to have faith in God. And that faith has almost vanished from the earth today. My friends, divine healing was not just for Jesus himself. He instructed all his followers who believe in God to trust in God as the healer. And healing the sick, as you will see if you carefully read your New Testament, was a vital part of preaching the gospel. Notice the inspired word of God on this. Turn. These are things you probably never saw before. Turn to your, in your Bible back to Matthew chapter 4, the very beginning of Christ's uh, teaching here, the beginning of his gospel. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. Now, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the coming kingdom or government of God, which he was going to set up as king of kings and lord of lords, and healing all kinds of sickness. God's not limited. You say, well, AIDS, that's incurable. No, AIDS is not incurable. Epstein-Barr, all these so-called incurable diseases, they're not incurable. God is in charge. He is a real God, and He can and will intervene for you if you learn to love that God and do what that God says. He healed all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And His fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to Him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and He healed them. He healed them all. Later, Jesus commanded his disciples to preach and to heal. Notice in Matthew chapter 10. Turn to chapter 10 now, if you would, of the Gospel of Matthew. Here he sends out these young men, not even converted yet. Not converted because the Holy Spirit did not come until after Christ's death in the day of Pentecost. Matthew 10, verse 1. And when Jesus had called his twelve disciples, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and notice and to heal all kinds of disease and all kinds of sickness. And so as he sent them out, he said in verse 7, as you preach, say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Jesus command to them, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Was divine healing just for Christ? No, the twelve apostles were to heal the sick. Was the healing just for the twelve apostles? Some think that, oh, well, that was just for the apostles. No way, it was not just for them. Notice also what your Bible says in Luke chapter 10. Turn over to Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. Oh, now we get to 82 men, 70 others beside the 12, which would be 82. And we find later in the book of Acts that both Stephen and Philip and others were healing the sick and casting out demons and performing great signs and wonders. There have been anywhere from 90 to 150 servants of God doing it back at that time. We don't know, but certainly there were at least 82. It wasn't just Jesus. Think about this. 70 others. And he sent them two by two before his face. And then he tells them here down in verse uh, 8, Whatever city you enter, as they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Heal the sick. A command from Christ to these 70 other young men beside the 12 apostles. Not apostles, 70 others. Heal the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. Yes, the power of that coming government of God was to be shown in the healing of the sick. It was a vital part of preaching the gospel. Now, notice Mark's gospel again. Turn with me back to the gospel of Mark, if you would, and notice some other things here that we need to read in chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, and beginning in verse 13. Jesus went up on the mountain and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve. Now he appoints the twelve apostles that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal. My friends, an atmosphere of faith is vital. 
Often we don't have faith in our modern society. We have all these ads on television. Take this pill if you had a headache. Take this pill if you want to go to bed. Take this pill if you want to wake up. Take this pill, you know, it goes on and on. People's minds are on that. Not on the Creator God anymore because people don't really study this book. Do you study this book? Do you have the mind of God? Do you think like God by having His book constantly, His thoughts in your mind? Think about it. Again, my friends, picture the millions of people in hospitals all over the world who are suffering. Think of the additional millions in the third world who don't even have an opportunity or the means to even get to a hospital if they wanted to. As the end of this age approaches, we should all want to help these people. We should have compassion on the people who need help. Often, God has to go above and beyond what men can do. For those of you who truly believe the Bible, there is an answer for these things and these terrible disease epidemics that are going to come. I want to offer you, my friends, a very helpful and well-documented booklet which will take many of you to a new dimension of biblical understanding. This booklet is entitled, Does God Heal Today? This very attractive booklet, well-documented booklet, will be sent absolutely free upon your request. So call or write today and ask for your free copy of this vital booklet entitled, Does God Heal Today? This booklet really will open your eyes to an important part of biblical Christianity, the type of, the type of Christianity practiced by Christ and the apostles and the early church of God. So call the toll-free number on your screen right now. Just ask for the booklet on healing. That's all you need. This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. With this offer, you will also receive your free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, full of timely articles and unique insights on today's important issues. Tomorrow's World Magazine keeps you up to date with world trends, Bible prophecy, and the very meaning of life itself. Tomorrow's World. Call now. Now, my friends, back to our topic, Does God Heal Today? Again, notice what Jesus' disciples did. Turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Here, it shows how Jesus went out to his own country and, of course, when the Sabbath came, he came in to teach in the synagogue, and uh, the people did not really believe in him. They were offended, saying, well, here's the son of Mary and the son of Joseph, and won't we know him and his brothers? Jesus had physical brothers are here with us. And they were offended. And Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, verse 4, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. The people closest to a true servant of God see his humanity. They don't necessarily see what God is doing in him. Now he could do no mighty work there. Notice this, my friends. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could do no mighty work there. Except he healed a few sick folk. He laid his hands. Yes, the laying on of hands... Jesus then had to even do that part here. He laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled. Why could he not heal there? He marveled because of their unbelief. And in Matthew's account, it says, because of their unbelief. Not his unbelief, their unbelief. According to your faith, be it unto you, Jesus had said. But this matter of healing was a vital part of the ministry of preaching the gospel. Verse 12 so he went out and preached that people should repent, or they went out. He sent out these uh, apostles once again and called the twelve, and they went out and preached that people should repent. That's the first thing. Turn around, go the other way, wake up and come to do what God says. Repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with uh, oil many who were sick and healed them. 
The true ministers of God nearly always carry or have access to a little bottle of olive oil. It's just a symbol of God's Spirit. I have this with me all the time, frankly. I used to carry it in my pocket loosely. It would sometimes get knocked out and have to get another one. So now I keep it in this little case. And uh, here is my little bottle of olive oil. So God's people who are faithful come and ask to be anointed and can be healed. And frankly, I know that thousands, multiple thousands, have genuinely been healed. And I'm not talking about hoop and holler things and people acting that out or whatever some do, but genuine healing. Yes, this is applicable today. Why? Because as you turn to Hebrews, if you want to turn there with me and see what your Bible says, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, God tells us here, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, the truth, you see, of God, whose faith follow, follow the faith of faithful ministers, considering the outcome of their conduct. Have they really taught the truth? What are the fruits? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ's basic way of working is always the same. His commandments are the same. His teaching is the same. If he healed then, he will heal today. Jesus Christ is the same. Understand that. Yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. My friends, years ago, when I was in a college, a religious college, let's call it, and we went out to visit people who asked to be visited and counseled about baptism, and they'd asked for this. We weren't going out trying to convince them we met in Kansas a lady with a withered arm, and this arm was just, had been just like a rope. It was about one-third or one-fourth the size of a regular arm. It just hung there limp and very small and withered ever since she'd been born. Here I was, just a young man in my mid-twenties, and she was already around, I don't remember, but about 45 or 50 years old, a farm lady, and she brought another lady from one of the mainstream Protestant churches of this you know, companion, so she wouldn't meet these two young men from the college alone. And she told us after we had visited with her and were about to leave, not to get anything, and she didn't hoop or holler at strange. She was very sound-minded. She said, by the way, fellas, I've sent out to your work and had an anointed cloth because God describes in Acts 19 about how Paul sent out little claws called anointed claws in place of personal healing, in place of personal anointing, and people would be healed. She said, I got this cloth last winter, and this arm used to be withered up about one-third the normal size, and it just began to grow right out. After about 45 or 50 years, this withered arm grew right out. And I, being from Missouri, by the way, I am from Missouri, the show me state, and I asked her Protestant friend, I said, well, have you seen her? Did you know all this? Oh, yeah, we grew up together. That's why one reason she was there, she was very impressed. She'd seen this arm grow right out in that sense on this woman. And she came and talked to us, although she wasn't interested totally, and God was not yet opening her mind. And she saw it. And she's seen what happened. And the lady then recounted something that almost brought tears to my eyes. She said, you know, fellas, she said, God healed this arm. She held her arms out. It was summertime. She was a farm lady. And she said, this is the regular arm, and this is the arm that was healed. She said, you'll notice it's a little bit smaller still. She said, I've noticed that God gave me back the strength in the arm, but he's letting me develop the muscles in the arm, and each month they get bigger. She said, now I'm able to milk my cows with both hands. Okay? I'm able to milk my cows with both hands because God healed her. Years later, I also had an experience with a young man in our college who was by this time in his late 20s, and he was completely crippled by some shrapnel or wounds in his body during the Korean War. One day, one of my friends in the ministry prayed for him, and he was healed. And I'd been on a trip to Chicago, I think it was, and our ministry came back, and one of the guys said, did you know that Howard was healed? I said, really? You're sure? Oh, yeah, he's been healed just over the weekend because, you know, so-and-so prayed for him. And then the next day, I saw him in front of the college building, and these old cars had these big, more flat fenders, and he was sitting on his fender. And I came around, and I said, Howard, 
I said, I heard you've been healed. Well, he had a wonderful sense of humor and he had a twinkle in his eye. He says, yeah. He says, you want to see me, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. You know, I'm from Missouri. So he got down off and he limped around sort of. He didn't seem to walk just straight at first. He'd just been healed about two days before and God let him build back the muscles. Later that autumn, before my first son, just hours before my first son, Michael Ray, was born, I performed a wedding and this man came through the wedding reception line afterward who'd been unable to even get out of his wheelchair. And here he was going through the line having had children, one child in each arm, kind of laughing and bouncing along. And that brought tears to my eyes. God healed him supernaturally. And that certainly gave me tremendous encouragement and faith. My friends, God does genuinely heal today those who believe. Those who are willing to believe that Jesus Christ is the same and He will do what He said He will do. But in our modern society, we have generally speaking lost that kind of faith. We've got so much sarcasm, so much modernism, that most people don't believe in the real God at all. And they doubt the Bible. They do not have that faith. All true Christians need to regain that faith. Notice, turn back to James now, the book of James here, right after the book of Hebrews. And the last chapter of the book of James, James was Christ's physical brother, inspired now of God. James tells us this, James chapter 5, follow me, turn here, James 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? What do you do? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. Yes, the anointing of the olive oil, like I showed you, in the name of the Lord. And laying hands on him, obviously, they anoint him with oil. This example is mentioned over and over and over in the Bible. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. That's a promise from Almighty God, the Creator. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses, or it can be your weaknesses, your your ailments, one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's what it says. It says that. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer. Not half-hearted prayers where people often just pray some memorized prayer. No, with all your heart, crying out to the God of creation. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We in this work of the great God do practice this, and we send out anointed clause for those who ask. If any of you truly believe in God, the God of the Bible, write or call us if you need to, and ask for an anointed cloth if you need to be healed. And if you'll put your faith and trust in God, call us, call the number, ask, or ask especially by writing us for that type of thing. Notice Jesus' commission, my friends, even for our time now. Turn, if you would, to the last uh, chapter of Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 16 now. Mark chapter 16, the very last chapter of the gospel of Mark. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. Here... After Christ had been resurrected, he tells us this last instruction. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven. Judas had fallen away, you remember, as they sat at the table. And here's the twelve disciples. The Holy Spirit hadn't yet come. They were the apostles, though, by now. And he rebuked their unbelief. Even they didn't believe like they should have done. It's so easy to doubt. So easy not to put our faith and trust in God And all of us need to pray about that and study this word. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. We read in the Bible, Romans 10, 17. As you read this book, as you understand it, God shows you that he is there and these things are real and these things are true. And so he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because even they did not believe those who'd seen him after he was risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature He who believes that is baptized will be saved. Uh, And he went on to say here, but he who does not believe will be condemned, or as the Greek word can be translated, judged, not utterly condemned, but that's another subject. 
And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues or languages. And that's the least of the gift, as God makes very clear back in 1 Corinthians 14. But they will occasionally be given the gift supernaturally to speak in different languages, not babble and, and yelling and screaming about nothing. They will take up serpents, again, accidentally, a smaller thing. But if they accidentally take up serpents, like Paul did when this viper came out of the firewood, or if they drink things accidentally that would be poison, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick. Notice this, just like we've seen through this whole series of passages in your Bible. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, after Christ had finished talking, he was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ, the living head of the church, was with them, guiding them, inspiring them, empowering them as they went out, and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. The signs were with them as they went out. The real God of the Bible is alive, my friends. He will heal those who put their full trust in Him. And we must understand that and come to have faith in that. How powerful that is as we approach the end of this age, the time when terrible disease epidemics, even pandemics, are going to strike our people. Where will we turn? We need to understand. Again, be sure to call us or write us today and request this very interesting and revealing booklet that we have for you, absolutely free, Does God Heal Today? This booklet will be sent free and without any obligation upon your request. This booklet will open your eyes to a very important part of true biblical Christianity that's mainly neglected today. And my friends, tune in every week to Tomorrow's World program. On this program, you'll gain precious information and insights available nowhere else. Richard Ames and I will give you understanding of current events and of the exciting prophecies of tomorrow's world. See you right here next week. This informative booklet is yours absolutely free. No cost, no obligation. If you call this toll-free number, 1-800-934-5579. That's 1-800-934-5579. Or send your request to Tomorrow's World, P.O. Box 3800, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28227. To view today's program, order the free literature offered, or for more information on today's vital subject, visit us online at www.tomorrowsworld.org. The preceding program is produced by the Living Church of God.